Wait. I'm still in Rome. I didn't go to Egypt. Why is there a pyramid in the middle of Rome? And what's that huge wall over there? Well, this is one of the more curious monuments in the Eternal City. And we're going to learn a little bit about this monument and the wall right next to it, which is also the largest remaining ruin of ancient Rome. Today, we're going to explore the tomb of Gaius Cestius. I'm Ariel with Urbanist, a show that is dedicated to exploring cities all around the world and its history. Welcome to this live exploration of the tomb of Gaius Cestius, the sole pyramid of Rome. Buongiorno everyone, I'm Ariel with Urbanist and welcome to the pyramid that lurks in the middle of Rome's skyline, the eternal city. However, why is there a pyramid in the middle of the eternal city? And no, it is not new. This dates back to 13 BC. Welcome Kay, welcome Amanda, welcome everyone. If you're just tuning in, let me know. what are you doing this morning? How's your morning going? What have you uh, done so far? Let me know how you're doing and let's explore the tombs of Gaius Cassius. And right here, Gaius Cestius, and right here is the Aurelian Wall. However, before we go to the pyramid, there's a very interesting monument here. It's pretty hard to find information about it in English, kind of forgotten it's all rusty and old but it's very poignant when they stopped here I was startled I had no idea what to make of it and it to me it kind of instills a little bit of fear this is a monument to to uh, in honor in mem in remembrance of the victims of fascism Nazism and racism Hello Amanda, welcome, nice to see you here. This was installed in 1995 and no one ever bothered to take it down. It has been standing ever since. Five people are marked here in chains, bonded, about to be shot by a firing squad. Each of them represents a different um, type of person who was persecuted. But what happened in fascist Italy? Well, for that we have to go all the way towards the very downfall of Benito Mussolini. The charismatic leader who first started as being a socialist and then ended up converting into a newfound philosophy of governance called fascism. Fascism has many differences from socialism, one of them being this totalitarian control over everything. Towards the end, as World War II was waning down, Benito Mussolini no longer had the support of the Italian people. They were tired of war, they were losing in, in Africa, and also they were overwhelmed by their enemies all around Europe. Benito Mussolini had to escape. He was being persecuted by the Italian people, people who were fighting back. He was heading out into Switzerland and he stopped by a village called Dongo in the very north of Italy. And in Dongo, Benito Mussolini was captured. He was dragged through the streets, killed, and then hung upside down by a gasoline station. For weeks, people would come, take, take stones and throw it to Benito Mussolini's body and all of his cohorts, about 16 or so of them. This was a very bloody scene. Another person ended up taking control of Italy and ended up ceasing the alliance with Nazi Germany. The Germans were pissed. And they came to invade Italy. They marched through Rome and they came all the way over here at this very spot right by the pyramid, the Appian Wall, and where this monument is now built. 
the Italian resistance started against Nazi Germany. Luckily, Italy managed to uh, switch sides, and the Americans, towards the end of World War II, end up also marching on Rome, but not facing resistance, but facing fanfare. These represent the five types of victims that were persecuted during World War II by fascists, by Nazis. And who are these five people? Let's see. Let's see. So they're supposed to be some markers. Let's see if we can find the markers. They might be erased by this point. Yeah, I think they're erased by this point. There used to be a, a brighter colored marker. One of them represents homosexuals, gypsies, anti-fascists, Jews, and the other one being um, resistance fighters. And those were the five main groups that were persecuted, according to this artist, during fascist Germany, and this is in remembrance of them. However, across the street, right by the pyramid, there is another monument to the fight against fascism. But before we talk about that, let's talk about this massive pyramid right in front of us. Let's wait until the crosswalk gives us permission to, uh, to cross over. In Rome, sometimes you can jaywalk, but not here. This is a very big thoroughfare. And why is it a big thoroughfare? Well, Rome's roads date way back to before the Renaissance. A good portion of Rome's roads that are still used today date back to the very foundations of ancient Rome. The Ro ancient Romans were known to build a road system all across Europe. They built the most sophisticated road system first ever in history even besting the Chinese by a few centuries. And those very road systems are used to this day. However, the Appian Wall is a very important marker for this road system because the Appian Wall was the entrance for these roads into Rome. That road is still in use right over here and we see the extension of the, or I, say, I said uh, Appian Wall, but I'm gonna say Aurelian Wall. This was the Appian Way, and this is the Ap uh, Aurelian Wall, right over here. Well, let's not actually get up close to the Aurelian Wall. And hello, Lauren. Let me know how are you doing. Hopefully, I'm seeing comments. Let me know if you're able to hear me well. Massive structure dates back to 240 AD. Took two emperors to build this, and this is the only major monument of the third century. What happened in the third century, and why wasn't there any other major monuments? There was no forums, no basilicas. No major villas built by emperors. Nothing. Just this wall. Here we're in the inside of this wall. And these come into play very soon. Mumbali, I'm so glad it sounds perfect and thank you Kay. So glad it sounds perfect. Then um, tell your friends and family about these videos so we have more people tuning in to these live videos like we've had in the past few videos, which is amazing. More than 10,000 views for, I think, the past three videos, which is mind-blowing for Rome since I've never been here and I don't really have a huge Italian following. Uh, it's awesome that somehow the word has been spreading. So thank you for everyone sharing, uh, like Mumbali and, and Kay, who both have that sharer badge, I see. Back in the third century AD, Rome was in crisis. It was in crisis because it was being attacked by all nations all around it. 
the Goths were attacking around the Danube, the Sassanids, which is modern day Syria, were attacking out in the east. The Gallics were establishing a new empire in modern day France, and then they invaded Spain and made the Gallic Empire. Also, there was raids from the Germani tribes all along modern day France. They were being attacked at every single direction. The empire was being split. This was very bad news for Rome and the city of Rome end up losing a whole lot of people. The population was dwindling and it was decreasing rapidly. Suddenly Rome went from 1 million people to I think it was about maybe 200, 300,000 massive decrease. The city was in ruins, it just survived a few plagues, and the emperors were being slaughtered. Taken away from their own villas on Palatine Hill, executed and thrown into the Tiber. This was meant to protect Rome from these barbaric invaders, the Goths, the Gauls, the remaining Gauls, or the new Gauls, and the Germanis. And then later the Huns, and many, many others, continue bombarding Rome. Rome was already delicate, and that was already the start of the fall of the Roman Empire. Rome wouldn't last too much longer than that. And this is a marker of the decline of Rome. It goes to show whether these walls were built to keep people out or to help Rome stay alive. Stay alive. You see the construction is very similar to, to even the Pantheon. Very similar similarities. Hello, Anfal. Ciao, amici. Bienvenuti. So I said, remember these graves. Right here. These are tombstones. Two of them. And there used to be thousands of them right over here outside the city walls, which ties into the Great Pyramid of Gaius Cestius. According to ancient Roman belief, it wasn't good, a good omen, wasn't good practice to have your necropolis, your buried dead, inside the city. So you had to have them outside the city. Very different practice from medieval times, because in medieval times people buried their dead, usually inside the city. Why did the Romans believe that? Well, it was a mixture of many different topics, but it's kind of a... They learned that from the ancient Egyptians. That said, since this was right outside the city walls, this was the great necropolis of ancient Rome. However, we have very, very few remaining tombstones. But by far the largest tombstone that we have remaining is this huge pyramid that was built in 13 BC. And it was built by Gaius Cestius, who was a member of the family of Marcus Agrippa. And you might remember the name Marcus Agrippa because Marcus Agrippa was the right-hand man of the first emperor of Rome, Augustus, also known as Octavian. You see the insignia of Marcus Agrippa up there. M.A. right there. But why a pyramid in Rome? Augustus. He, in order to become emperor of Rome, had to defeat the great Mark Antony. And Mark Antony was a formidable enemy. He was one of the greatest generals in ancient Roman history. That's why he was under the wing of Gaius Julius Caesar. The main battle in order to take 
the very first emperorship of Rome was fought in Egypt. Octavian needed to conquer the armies of Cleopatra who were on the side of Mark Antony. And thus Octavian went into Egypt. But as he went into Egypt, it was a very similar story as Napoleon went into Egypt almost a thousand five hundred years later. As he went to, into Egypt, he brought back with him a whole lot of Egyptian memorabilia. Tombs, obelisks, and a bunch of other things. Iconography of Egypt. Paintings were made, frescoes, etc., etc., etc. And the fashion of the day was to be Egyptian. Gaius Cestius was a man struck with Egyptomania, that fascination with ancient Egypt. The ancient Egypt that they saw while they were attacking the armies of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And also it was great to be associated with ancient Egypt because it was a marker that he was a conqueror of Egypt. He was associated with the conqueror of Egypt being Augustus, being uh, the defeater of the conqueror of Mark Antony. And he built his tomb in the likeness of an Egyptian pyramid. This only took 330 days to build, less than a year. It's about 118 feet tall, so it's huge. However, this wasn't the only pyramid in Rome. There were many others. Three, at least, were historically verified. One of them used to be right in front of the Vatican, all the way until the medieval ages. But once the St. Peter's Basilica started being upgraded, they had to take down that pyramid because it was right in the way of the streets that they wanted to build that leads to the Vatican. The other one, no one knows why it was taken down. However, there's theories that there were many, many others. So Gaius Cestius, the, arist the aristocrat from ancient Rome, wasn't the only type of person who loved Egyptian iconography. And it goes to show that Egyptomania didn't only hit New Yorkers in the 1900s, it hit the ancient Romans. Here is the pyramid of Gaius Sustius. Now the pyramid is, is accessible via tours on the weekends. And you can go inside and see Pom Pompeian style frescoes. Let's see the markers over here and the and the monument to the resistance against the Nazis. And have I had a chance to go to the Jewish ghetto? No, I, I, I went there, but not on live video. I haven't found that much history to talk about. It's very light history. Pretty much that the word ghetto comes from that area. So maybe I'll do a tiny, light, a tiny live video, but I'm not entirely sure, but I haven't covered it yet. His memories to various battalions and soldiers. And this is a monument to the resistance fighters against Nazi Germany during World War II. And hello, Václav. Welcome. Nice to see you here. And there is a lot of tombs in Rome. Yes, there is. And there is the Baker's Tomb. The Baker's Tomb is nowhere near Egyptian style. The Baker's Tomb actually is really interesting. It looks very weird looking to our modern day eyes, but it was built like a huge oven. Yeah, Jewish Ghetto, I recommend going there and visiting, but for making a video, there's not that much to cover. At least, not easy history to find. Usually when it comes to more of these smaller neighborhoods in foreign countries, it's fine to find the smaller stories of history in English. And since I don't know Italian, it makes it a little bit more difficult to research these topics in depth in order to make a, a video like I do with most of my history videos.
So let's walk around. You can see it is open for guided tours twice a month, the second and fourth Saturday of the month, and also the Sunday, but you need to make reservations. Ooh, a lot of flies in this area. And, and fall, I'm so glad you're watching from Malaysia. That's amazing. I hope to go to Malaysia one day. If I'm correct, Malaysia has uh, Kuala Lumpur. Forgive me if I'm um, mistaking it with Indonesia, but uh, I am really eager to explore Malaysia as well, being so close proximity to Singapore. I know there's a whole lot of history there because um, the Malaysians end up conquering a huge swath of, of, um, of the, the island chains in that area. All right, let's keep on walking. Yes, okay, I was right, Kuala Lumpur. I've seen photos of Kuala Lumpur, it just utterly struck me as a gorgeous place. If you have any recommendations of why I should look into Kuala Lumpur, let me know. Right here, there's this train station called Lido. And here are the trams that run around the kind of the outer perimeter of Rome. So you can go to like the, the outer, outer uh, municipalities of Rome. Rome has 20, uh, what they call Vioni, which are kind of boroughs or, um, or arrondissements or, or neighborhoods, as you would say in the, in the other cities. Here we have an example of like fascist architecture the type of architecture that Benito Mussolini commissioned in order to show its association to the greatness of ancient Rome. Right here, let's see if we can actually take a peek down here. Because down here is something very special. We talked a lot about Roman Catholic history. The pyramid sticking out there also cool. We talked a lot about Roman Catholic history, but, you know, Rome, Italy as a whole, wasn't, hasn't ever been so welcoming to other religions. But by the 1800s, I started loosening up a little bit, and you had many English people come over here to Rome and settle down, one of them being John Keats, a very famous writer. It's not as populous as Paris, and that's why here in Rome we don't have too many stories of uh, these expats like we do in Paris. Great stories of Hemingway and, and uh, Fitzgerald, etc., etc., etc. Also in London has a bunch of stories of expats. Here not so much because Rome has always been pretty close. But in the 1800s they started opening up just a little bit, and they gave way a little piece of land for a Protestant cemetery. Cemetery. And here it is. This is probably one of the quietest parts of Rome. Rome doesn't have too many cemeteries inside its inner city. But here's one of the very few. So this is probably one of the very few places in the Eternal City that is dedicated to Protestants. As I mentioned, a bunch of English people started coming here in the 1800s. Uh, that's very visible in the Spanish Steps. Right next to the Spanish Steps is a tea house called the, I think, Barrington Tea House. One of the very few tea houses in all of Rome as well. Rome is mostly a coffee drinking culture. That was opened up by an English woman who dearly missed uh, afternoon tea 
here in Rome because she couldn't find those scones, cakes, and great teas like oolong and Earl Grey. And she opened a tea house right in the center of where a lot of these English people were living. John Keats was living right next door. And the English people usually hung out in that specific tea house. However, they lived here. This was their home, just like Hemingway's home or Jim Morrison's home was Paris. Uh, for Keats and a few others, this was their home and they had nowhere, no place to be buried because they were Protestant and this was a Roman Catholic city in a Roman Catholic country. But luckily they end up getting permission to be buried here for the only Protestant cemetery in all of Rome. Ciao, Rino, Gail, lovely day here. It is lovely day here. Exploring a beautiful cemetery in Rome. However, before Protestants were ever buried here, this was a graveyard for the pagans. The pagans being the ancient Romans. Ooh. Interesting tombstone. This is John Louis Piccoli, who's from New York. Oh, fascinating. A New Yorker is buried here. And John Keats is somewhere around here. I think he's at the very end. Well, here we have a Freemason. A symbol, Freemason symbol. Who's his name? James Irvine of Aberdeen. He seems to have been a member of the Royal Institution of Edinburgh. Here we have an Irish woman, Caroline Kirkpatrick, 1821, from Down, Ireland. She died in Rome in 1901. So, it might have been an Irish Protestant, because this is not a Roman Catholic burial place. So I assume Down might be in Northern Ireland. Down might be up in Ireland. Lauren, if I had to base myself in any other city, where would I go? The answer is still London. Of course, I have many other cities to explore and that might change, but London is still top of my list. Even though I've been to Paris and Rome, I really enjoy these cities for traveling. I still see myself living for a while in London. <laughs> Thank you, Kay, for clarifying. Down is up in the north, yeah. Aberdeen, Scotland, the city of your birth. Oh, Melissa, um, Melissa, yeah, your grandfather was also a Mason. Ooh, interesting, like Irvine. Hello, Tuba, I'm so happy you're, you're tuning in. Well, I'm in the graveyard because we're talking about graveyards from ancient Rome to the 1800s Protestants that have been here. But to stay tuned because at 3 p.m. today for the final episode of Mysteries of the Eternal City, we're going to wrap up our story of the great Emperor Hadrian. How did he die? And what did he do with his great lover, Antonius? And then we're going to learn about the dead who still lurk in the Eternal City. Luckily, this is a very peaceful cemetery, but not the place we're going to. Stay tuned later tonight as we go to Pont Sant'Angelo and Castle Sant'Angelo, and potentially the Museum of Purgatory. Best uh, graveyard I've seen is in Copenhagen, 
in Valby neighborhood. Oh, interesting. I'm also eager to go to Copenhagen at some point. Interesting history there as well. And this is built on the perimeter of the Aurelian Wall. So that is the wall surrounding this graveyard. Okay, likewise. I'm enjoying like just looking at this graveyard. They're always so fun. And this one seems very quaint and quiet and small enough that you won't get super lost in. Unlike a, a Perlachez or Calvary Cemetery cemetery in New York City. Greenwood as well is another really big one. This one's much more smaller. Oh, a Danish poet is buried here. Carlston Hotch. And it's very well kept, yeah. Well, this only dates back to the 1800s. Then again, there's, there's some cemeteries that date back to the 1800s that are not well kept. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, a lot of people here are buried from 1800, and then we have people as late as nine. Uh, I've, there's probably a few modern of them, but also a lot of people from the 1900s, like here, 1980, 1973. Jewish person as well. So this is a Protestant-owned cemetery. However, anyone can bur be buried here, and they do accept people of all ethnicities and religions. However, the majority of people here are indeed Protestant. This is a huge mausoleum. Well, huge in the context of the other graveyards here. Marie, welcome. Nice to see you here. Hope all is well in Kilkenny, Ireland. And that brings us to the end of our tour. I'm going to linger here in front of this huge mausoleum and learn a little bit more about the dead who lurk in front of Pont San Angelo. Stay tuned tonight, today at 3 p.m. Rome time, 9 a.m. New York City time for the very final episode of Mysteries of the Eternal City. I hope you're enjoying these broadcasts. If you are, press that heart button and let your friends and family know or any groups on Facebook. Sharing these videos with groups on Facebook really helps out. Getting the more people we have on these broadcasts means I can do more broadcasts around very interesting places all around the world. See where the mysteries lurk 
and show it to you so you can join in vicariously through Facebook Live video. I love doing these and I would love to keep on doing them in crazier, crazier places. Thank you so much for watching. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Arrivederci amici. See you at 3 p.m. Ciao amici.